Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for today's session. I hope that you enjoyed um, the other sessions that we had today and the networking. Um, so hopefully you got to connect with some old and new friends. And um, we are back for our second breakout session for today. So I'm very pleased to introduce Allison Alvarez with Blast Point. So she will, as the title says on the screen, learning from broken things. So Allison, welcome. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, and uh, this is gonna be a ride. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, dive right in. Um, so my name's Allison. I love learning from broken things. Um, I've given some previous talks here at TechFest, including ones on uh, learning from my own mistakes as well as uh, classic and uh, uh, famous bugs. I've given uh, another talk on how to build algorithms that uh, won't complete before the heat death of our own sun. Um, and so I, sometimes I think the best way to learn about um, making things amazing is studying them when they're less than amazing. Um, and as an example, um, you know, this, this talk is going to go all the way from the pyramids, and I'm very literal about that, all the way up to this year in 2021. Um, and this is the bent pyramid. Um, and I love, like, I, I don't want to start this talk with like aliens, um, but uh, uh, it's, you know, it, it's one of the things that proves that like, uh, and, and it has such a basic math mistake in it, that it kind of proves that like, Aliens are not the ones who built the pyramids. Um, this pyramid is actually located on a military base um, in Egypt, so it can not always easy to get to. But this is a picture of me inside the pyramid itself, um, and you can see that it started out at a really steep angle, and then they changed it to a much less steep angle. And from this, they're able to figure out that you know the pyramids need to be about forty three degrees. Um, and you'll see right next to this pyramid is another one called the Red Pyramid. It's a lot like the pyramids at Giza. In fact, it's the third largest pyramid, um, and it, it it was you know a transitional form. And you know if if you know, we're watching the, the Egyptians learn from their mistakes. We're doing the exact same things as engineers, even in modern day. And it shows that sort of engineering, um, you know, perfections and imperfections are kind of eternal. Um, and, you know, the one thing I do want to talk about is like, I've read countless articles that say, you know, software engineers aren't real engineers. And I say that as total garbage, um, both as a software engineer, I think you guys all here uh, are either you know, somewhat affiliated with software engineering um, or want to be. And, you know, I'd say the one big thing that separates us from a lot more of the, you know, traditional engineering, especially things like structural engineering, um, are things like this stamp. Um, and if you are certified to be a structural engineer in um, every state in the United States, you get this cool stamp or you might get a crimper so you can have like a little emboss seal. Um, and basically, anytime you have plans that Come across your desk that you either designed or you approved, um, you have this stamp on it. And it's this way of holding accountability. Um, and I know we have blame in GitHub, for example. This is not the same thing. Um, you know, in a lot of the cases that I studied for this, um, people lost their careers, they were prosecuted, some of them even went to jail for doing things not quite right. That's not something that you know we tend to you know, has have as part of our risk landscape um, in software engineering as much. Um, but if people can be held to that level of accountability and buildings still fall down and bridges still fall down and, you know, we have all kinds of things that fail, what does that mean? Um, and I, I think, you know, by looking at those places where things still fail, um, we can learn systemically uh, things that not only apply to making engineering better, but I think they directly apply to us as software engineers because there's a lot of things like hubris um, that are going to be the same through you know both sets of professions. And just to dive in on you know one particular example, this is Three Mile Island nuclear power facility, finally decommissioned in 2019 um, after you know a particularly egregious meltdown, um, you know one of the most serious nuclear accidents in history, um, and you can see look at that instrument panel. Um, it, it looks very busy, doesn't it? There's a lot of things going on. Um, and it means that like design's a big part of what's going on here. You can tell this is modern because there's that flat screen in front. Um, but, you know, a lot of this is just like looking at tons and tons and tons of, you know, different little pieces of uh, the nuclear reactor. So, you know, one fun thing about nuclear reactors is like, even when they're completely shut down, they have what's known as decay heat. Um, you know, as uh, and so even if the the reactor is not 
really going. Um, the uranium atoms are still decaying. They're still throwing up a little bit of um, heat. So you have to constantly keep them cool, um, which means that you, know, it, you have the potential to boil off water if you can't constantly supply it. Um, and that's what happened at Three Mile Island, what happened at Fukushima, um, you know, and, just, and, and a really extreme example, that's also what happened at Chernobyl. And you know, if you look at this, you know, this panel here, I want you to like just look at it and like, what do you see? Um, and you can see that people have made modifications here. They've added tags, um, and you know, one of these tags is what obscured sort of a backup sensor. So that uh, so the first sensor that failed, it was wired to a solenoid rather than like a valve itself. So when uh, they're like close this valve, um, the solenoid was like good job, and when the valve wasn't actually closed. It, it didn't get back to the instrument panel itself. Um, the other part of it is that there's, you know, sort of a, you know, a pressure sensor, so you can see, you know, down the line you know, whether things are functioning properly, and it was obscured by one of these tags. And you know, I think in software engineering, uh, it, you know, we we kind of end up with this uh, attitude about our users in that like they don't know what they're doing. Um, you know, we design things in a specific way and then they use them wrong. Um, and you can look at that instrument panel and, you know, kind of start with that opinion, which I'm going to be real honest, that's where I started out with this. Um, but, you know, one of the things we can learn about is, you know, what's the difference between design and user experience. And, you know, user, you know, design shouldn't come before user experience, it should be informed by you know, users needs their cognition, um, how they're going to use things. And like the important thing is that users are not the same as the people who are designing things. And so, you know, even for things like, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, table saws, um, you know, you could say, okay, um, lots of people get their fingers cut off in, in table saws. The solution is don't do that. Um, or you can think of it as a design problem and build a system that will automatically take into account that sometimes things happen, um, and that we should, you know, stop, uh, uh, you know, the, the the saw here, and you know, oftentimes it wrecks the blade. Um, so there's a cost to doing this, but it's also something that, um, you know, it's it's definitely worth doing. Um, and you know, it's not your fault as an engineer if you build a you know a saw and someone cuts their finger off on it because they're not doing adequate safety. But isn't it so much better if you automatically take that into account? And design it into your systems that there's going to be some sort of failure. Um, and you know, when you think about that and you look back at this panel, you can say, okay, they had to add all this extra information to this panel um, because like there were things either lacking in training or there are things that were not clear from the panel itself. So these are like actually like tool tips and bug notes, um, you know, built into the panel, which means the panel in the first place wasn't built right. Now, in a nuclear reactor, it's very it's very expensive to replace these things in midstream and very dangerous. But as software engineers, we have a lot more capacity to change and upgrade these things as things go along. Um, and you know, the reason I'm talking about this stuff in this way is that um, you know, with software engineering, a lot of the stuff can seem like abstraction, and it's a lot easier to remember these things if you have a story to go along it. So, you know, what I'm going to do is break down um, a collection of uh, you know, different uh, engineering failure cases so that we have stories behind these things so it's easier to remember why they're important. And you know, the other thing I wanna say is like, um, you know, bad systems, broken systems, it's almost never, never, never any one single person. Um, when I, you know, looked at um, potential engineering cases, there was never any one thing that caused these. Um, and just to sort of, you know, ask ourselves, like, you know, what exactly is an engineering disaster? Um, this is an example of one. So this is the, the Harvard, Hartford Civic Center um, uh, where they um, built this like interior truss design. Uh, they relied too much on computer models. And even when it was cracking, they're like, no uh, uh, construction crew, this can't be cracking. The, the simulation says it should be fine. Um, and of course, during the first light snowfall after it was built, it collapsed. Um, and you know, here's another potential engineering disaster. So in this case, this is Lac Magantique in, um, in Quebec, where a train ran down the tracks, hit a curve and fell off. And the whole reason you know, the train did that in the first place was number one, it was not put on a siding like it was supposed to, it was left on the main tracks. The train was left running, which is standard of practice for that rail line. They only had one engineer. So usually you have two crew members running um, a train like that. So he was tired, maybe not being as precise as he should be. Um, the train was lacking maintenance. It caught on fire. 
uh, the, the fire department put out the fire on the train and then turned it off. And when you turn a train off, uh, the hydraulics turn off, which means like the, if there aren't enough uh, air brakes set, it will roll downhill. And that's exactly what happened. So, you know, the train was doing all the things it should do as a train, but the system around it was broken and the way it was used was being broken. And I would say that also classifies as an engineering disaster. Um, this could also be an engineering disaster. So this is um, the Beirut explosion in 2020, um, where there was a seized um, fertilizer that caught on fire, caused a gigantic explosion. Um, you know, I'd, I'd say eh, maybe not for this one. Um, uh, uh, like, I, I think it could be an engineering disaster, but it's not. I don't know if there's things we can learn from it because if it's like, don't store explosives near fire. So this is another example of. Uh, of one here um, in the 1944 Bombay explosion. This is a munitions center um, that blew up. Um, and there's a lot of uh, uh, case studies I read that were like, you know, two ships full of explosions hitting each other, um, like at in Halifax or in Texas City, um, you know, a, a ship full of explosions catches on fire. Uh, I'm gonna say the explosions were doing what they were supposed to do. Um, and maybe there's not a ton we can learn from there. So I'm gonna just sort of set those cases aside. But otherwise we're looking at human built structure. So I'm not look, talking about landslides or anything like that. I'm talking about the fault has to be designed with the, you know, the design of the, the system, the execution, the intended usage, um, you know, the natural disasters that affect the structures have to be foreseeable. Um, like in, you know, you're building in, a, in an earthquake area, uh, prone area, and you're not, you know, uh, uh, putting enough, um, you know, engineering into preparing for a seismic event, that kind of thing. Um, and you know, the, the sample I chose, not scientific. So I was looking for high impact, easy, you know, easy to remember, likely to have a full write up. Um, and, you know, not everything I could find was in English. So I did my best. Um, and so here are um, the 49 um, uh, N ones that I chose. Um, uh, and for, you know, 48 of these, I ended up basically writing out like an index card. I've got them with me right now. Um, basically going through every single incident and looking at what were the causes. Um, and, you, and like I said before, you'll notice there's not a single bullet point on any of these cards. And in fact, a lot of them are covered front to back, just looking at the causal factors that come together. And, you know, there's a, here's the rough breakdown of, you know, the, the types of structures that ended up failing. You see, there's a lot of bridges in here. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of bridge failures. Um, uh, it's sort of at the dawn of, you know, iron working for bridges, um, you know, before uh, there was a, a lot of built up knowledge about, you know, how bridges should be built, what are the most safe designs, how do you build for redundancy. Um, but in the latest one I, I, I cover collapsed in 2018, um, you know, well into us knowing how to build a bridge. Um, and so I think it's, there's a lot you can learn from that kind of thing. Um, and so looking at you know one of these in depth so here is um the hyatt regency walkway collapse prior to to 9 11. um this is like the most serious loss of life in a building structure failure in the history of the united states um it was a bunch of people on sort of two suspended walkways above a dance above what was made into a dance floor for the day um and the the walkways themselves uh were extremely under, under engineered it was an overly complicated design so they were you know not you know, they were kind of using new thoughts about how to build these kinds of structures. They had inadequate safety margins. Um, and because of the, the design was overly complicated, it wasn't immediately obvious that the, 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 the safety margins were being breached. Um, that they ended up changing the design where like the, the second floor walkway hung off of the fourth floor walkway, doubling the load. Um, and that, you know, compromised it even more. Um, when they went to build the design, you know, the actual, um, you know, site engineers were like, well, we can't build it like this, so we have to change. Um, so there's, uh, if you look in the corner here, there's sort of like a diagram of like a, a critical component for holding up the walkways and connecting them. They're like, we can't do it like that. So they went from the original design to the actual construction. And when it went back to the original designers, they didn't say, oh, okay, let's redo our math. They were like, check, this looks fine. Um, and, uh, you know, when the walkways collapsed on top of that complicating everything was the sprinkler system went off um, and no one could figure out how to turn it off. And I couldn't find any records of actual drownings in the deaths, um, but there are several people who nearly drowned just because like there's, you know, they're trapped in wreckage, they can't move and there's just water flowing down on their faces, um, choking them. So 
whole system of faults. Um, you know, if we you know look at Bhopal, Bhopal, India is a city the size of Philadelphia, um, and through the nature of unfortunate zoning, had a union carbide um, uh, chemical factory built in the middle of it, um, and. Uh, the 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 place was severely underinvested um, due to the lack of maintenance. They slowly took off basically every safety factor, um, and there were a lot of redundancies uh, keeping everything in line. There's a lack of safety training, a lack of urgency. When things failed, uh, they, it came out of like this uh, 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 like a pipe far away, like uh, from the actual factory itself, where they knew things were wrong. Um, there was supposed to be a flame that burned off um, the chemicals. It didn't work, um, and you know. To, to, to compact it, there are major communication issues. So there are crying wolf warnings where, you know, they'd, you know, the, they'd, you know, sound the horn and say something's wrong. Well, they did it really often. So the people in the neighborhoods around the factory were like, ah, this is like how it always is. So they didn't feel any urgency when something was really wrong. Um, they didn't have communication with the public. Uh, there's a, a train full of people who almost died, um, you know, going through a station nearby where the, the chemicals were pooling. And what's really interesting is like this, um, you know, this insecticide um, that caused this problem, it's also being manufactured. Um, I, I, I haven't figured out if it's still being manufactured in West Virginia, actually a short drive from here. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot to learn from this, but like there's a, there's a whole chain of things here. And if any one of these things had not failed, it's possible that this would have either not happened at all or been less severe. Um, and you know, looking at and totaling up, you know, all of these uh, factors, I found, you know, some really key themes that, oh, as an off software engineer, some of these sounded really familiar. So we're going to talk about these like one by one, but we've got like design flaws. You know, as a CEO, I actually think like poor leadership is something that is really worth studying um, and understanding, you know, because this is stuff, the stuff that's easiest to fix. It's just like the decision part. Um, there's this, you know, this German concept that when you, you know, when you have something that you need to fix, you fix it first through organization and processes, then you fix it with electronics, and then you invest in changing um, infrastructure itself. Um, and so the leadership is like the cheapest thing. Um, and if you could be better at this, a lot of this stuff could have been inverted. Um, there's also communication issues um, that are, are really basic here. Secrecy is a big one. Um, a lack of regulatory oversight and Hey, this should sound familiar, like old technology is not being updated when safer alternatives are found. So that's, you know, an age old maintenance issue that we deal with also in, in software engineering. So looking at these, um, so there's fail dangerous instead of fail safe. Pretty much everything that I studied that had like hydraulics as a major part, part of the failure was a big piece of it because like, you know, the, the fire would burn through the hydraulic line and the doors wouldn't open or the brakes stopped. Um, it was always something like that. Um, so, it, you know, it meant that if something broke, it failed in the dangerous direction, not the safe direction. Um, there's advancing new technology without adequate testing. Uh, I'm definitely guilty of this where, you know, you're like, oh, look at this cool new thing. I want to use the cool new thing. Um, and you don't think, you know, there are many, many more tried and true things that already exist that we should be using in its place. And this, one of those examples, uh, one of these examples are the Florida International University um, pedestrian bridge collapsed, collapsed while it was being built. Um, you know, one of the key reasons this thing failed is that it's made out of a concrete truss. Um, and if you're like, know anything about trusses, those two words don't belong together. Um, if you look at um, uh, the bridges here in you know, good old Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, we have a million truss bridges. There's a lot of them. Um, hot metal bridge is one of them. Uh, and they're all made out of metal, um, you know, which is a you know, ductile, uh, you know, flexes with stress kind of thing. Concrete's not really known for doing that. Um, and it was something that the, the engineering team really wanted to do. They really wanted to have sort of like a feather in their cap of advancing technology. Um, and they ended up building something that, you know, there are many, many bridge designs out there um, and they, they work really consistently and they decided to do something new. They didn't test it. Um, and even when there are issues found, they didn't, for example, contact uh, the Florida Department of Transportation to shut down the highway. And they ended up killing six people when this when this bridge collapsed. Um, even more egregiously is the Sampung department store. Um, it's it's uh, located in or was formerly located in Seoul, Korea. It's built on top of a, a landfill, so it's already got like a less than stable foundation. 
It was originally supposed to be uh, residential buildings, but they decided to make it into a gigantic department store, which meant modifying um, the plans repeatedly over and over again. Um, and the, the engineering team, when they saw the, the changes happening, they resigned um, and they were like, we're not doing this. And Sampung is a, uh, I don't know the Korean for, word for it, but in, in Japanese it'd be Zaibatsu. So it's like a, you know, a big horizontally integrated giant corporation. Mitsubishi would be an example of one. Um, so they, you know, they build cards, bridges, pens, everything. Um, and Sampung was the same. Um, and so they had their own in-house construction team that they used instead. Um, and they kept changing things without, you know, going back and doing the math, they thin the columns, they made less columns, they put a restaurant floor on the fifth floor that had like, you know, it had to be three feet of concrete so they could have, you know, a heating, uh, uh, like heated floors and actually heated floors are awesome, but they should be a part of the design from the beginning. Um, and so when the building collapsed, um, you know, it killed uh, 500 people um, and, uh, you know, none of it, should have happened, you know, all of, all of the technology existed to go back and check the math on this. And because they had sort of the chairman running everything, no one questioned him and no one did the due diligence to make sure that the, the department store was safe. Um, for, uh, you know, like not designing for severe but expected operating conditions, I give you the example of the B-22 Osprey. So it's like not quite a helicopter, not quite an airplane. Um, it, it does not, uh, so, you know, if an airplane loses power, it will glide down by its wings. If a, heli if a helicopter loses power, it will spin down on its blade. Um, the V2 Osp uh, V22 Osprey does neither. Um, it was designed basically to be, you know, that hybrid that could pick up troops, you know, individually without a runway, um, you know, on a battlefield and then cruise like a plane so it could take them really far away really quickly. Um, and, you know, one of the big problems with this thing is that it could not operate in severe dust. Um, and this is designed for the Marines and the Marines were doing, you know, lots of things in areas with lot with desert. Um, and so if the crew thing you're building can't operate in desert because it's too much dust, like it, it, that is, that is a major, major design flaw. And it makes, you know, it, it really uh, messes with like troop readiness time. It, you know, it, there's been quite a few fatal accidents because of that. Um, and so it's something that's like, yeah, maybe this should not have been, um, an, another example of a design flaw is just, you know, the, the, the failure indicators are not visible. Um, so this one is like pretty literal. Um, it's the Almo Bridge in, um, in Sweden. Um, basically this big boat here hit the bridge um, it, and knocked it down. And it was such a foggy day um, that no one could really see anything. Um, the, the river was iced over. So they, they couldn't, you know, get out of the boat and like uh, block off the bridge. Um, they, the, they damaged their communication tower so they couldn't even radio anybody. Um, and so there were cars driving off of the bridge because they had no idea it was closed. Um, you know, another example of like the failures, not, indicators not being visible, there's also um, a bridge that collapsed in West Virginia called the Silver Bridge. It was made of an I-beam where it had a crack in it um, and you couldn't quite see it. Um, and even after inspections, it wasn't visible. And it ended up failing and you know being one of the the most deadly uh, uh bridge collapses in u.s history so i'm looking at my card uh it ended up killing uh 46 people almost immediately um and uh you know so it, it's not only that failure factor in indicators not vi visible it's also that lack of redundancy because once that i-beam failed the rest of the bridge failed and it took one part one thing um to kill 46 people um, so there's this idea of uh, poor leadership. Um, there's a Japanese phrase uh, that's like the fish rots from the head. That's definitely true in this case. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, leadership being unresponsive when staff raise concerns. Um, and this is something that has happened, you know, twice at NASA, if not more, um, because in both cases, um, you know, engineers raise concerns in, in Challenger's case about um, the, the safety of the launch on a cold day um, in Columbia. Like people noticed from the, from the video, they saw the foam hit um, the wing of Columbia. Um, they went to management about it. Um, uh, the Department of Defense actually has spy satellites um, where they can look at, at things with like really, really high precision um, and NASA turned them down because they were like, well, uh, you know, we don't know what we do if we found a flaw, but like they didn't even try. Um, and so in both cases, there are people who realized something was wrong ahead of time. They went to management and they were ignored. And in both of these cases, um, 
you know, uh, NASA in the face of the lack of information. So for example, for Challenger, they didn't have information on launches on cold dates because they hadn't done it. And so they took the lack of data as being like, okay, do it, than rather being like, okay, here's the lack of data. We should focus on being safer and getting that data in place before we do something that risks human lives. Um, so another one of these um, uh, is, you know, the need to be on, on time or ahead of schedule regardless of conditions. So it's very Soviet thinking, pretty much like a, like half of the, the cases in the former Soviet Union that I, I studied, it was everybody trying to like the Netherlands disaster happened because they were trying to be 10 months ahead of schedule. Um, uh, or, you know, meet un really unreal unrealistic production deadlines and putting pressure on people. And so people cut corners. Um, in the case of Rana Plaza, um, which was a building um, that collapsed. So it, it was originally supposed to be an office building and it ended up containing um, clothing factories along with like a lot of other things. Um, and they knew the building was collapsing in advance. They saw the cracks, they sent everybody home, but they had such deadline pressures, um, the, the garment factories that were based inside the building did, that they sent people back to work. Um, even when the building was clearly unsound. And they did that because they felt a lot of pressure to hit these deadlines, but they still put people's lives at risk to do that. Um, in Chernobyl, like I, I like it's funny because I saw this lack of safety culture, like that exact phrasing come up in at least like 10 things I looked at, um, including uh, Challenger and Columbia. Um, but in Chernobyl, you know, when Chernobyl happened, uh, they're running, you know, experiments. Like I said, there's that de decay heat in nuclear reactors. So uh, if the power shuts off, you have to have a backup means to keep that water circulating on top of the core. And you know, with Chernobyl, they built something that costs one quarter of the price of a heavy water reactor, um, but it uh, was something that actually could create, you know, a chain reaction. You know, any this, you know, Chernobyl was either a uh, steam explosion or a nuclear fizzle. And they don't know quite which, because uh, no one should be going in there. Um, and uh, you know, both of those come from you know, not having that water going, going over the core. And what they did was they shut off their power artificially um, so they could test their internal um, systems you know, to see if the backup power would kick in on time um, you know, uh, uh, to cover the, their needs for keeping the water circulating. Um, they, you know, they were supposed to do the, the, the test earlier in the day um, and said they did it with the, instead of doing it with the day crew, they did, it, they did it with the night crew, which means the guy that pushed the scram button is the AZ-10 button. If you've seen the, the Chernobyl series on HBO, his name was Tupolov. He'd only been in his job for three months. Um, so he didn't have like that internalized, you know, uh, understanding of what was going on to be useful in a crisis he died. And so everything was pretty much blamed on him pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the scram reactor, you know, was built incorrectly so that, you know, it actually, it could have caused a chain reaction instead of stopping it um, just based on, you know, what the, the material, the tips of the rods were made of. So there are so many things that went wrong, but like they were doing an experiment that did not need to happen. And it was because leadership was like, Hey, we need to make, you know, we need to be ahead of time on making sure we hit these safety tests. And that's what caused this, uh, this issue. If, if leadership hadn't been so blind about getting this done, this would have never happened. Um, you can see something really similar in Tokai Muda, um, which uh, was a affiliated with like a nuclear um, facility. So it's, it's, it's kind of its own thing. They build essentially nuclear fission products. Um, so what those two guys are doing, um, A and B in the picture, is circumventing a system that's designed to precipitate, precipitate sorry, um, uranium fuel out of a suspended mixture. And the thing is, is like the way nuclear reactions work, if you get too much nuclear material in one place, you know, it, like nuclear material is basically a big probability field. Um, when it decays, it splits off pieces, the pieces hit other atoms. And so it keeps that, you know, that, you know, the fission going. And if you could do that too much, it's a nuclear chain reaction, very difficult to stop. Um, these guys were taking, were under pressure from their leadership to basically, deliver these top targets ahead of time. So instead of using the system as expected, which would do things really slowly, they were do th doing things in a bucket so they could do it really quickly. And when you, do, when you really concentrate nuclear material, they got you know, that, 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 uh, that chain reaction, they got that, um, uh, that Curie ra radiation, like that blue flash, um, so that you know something's really wrong. Um, and you know, it ultimately, like, their supervisor was in C and overseeing them. He's like, he lived. Uh, the other two guys didn't, um, and it's because they, you know, they had that pressure 
to get this done in, in like, you know, the one place where you should never, ever, ever cut corners, which is with nuclear materials. Um, so we've also got, you know, you know, these, this communication failure theme. So like, um, you know, Piper Alpha was a, uh, a, uh, oil drilling platform in the North Sea. So it's very cold. Um, they were, uh, you know, testing a system, they'd taken it offline. Um, and when there was a shift change, shift change, see, like same thing with Chernobyl. Um, uh, one of the engineers in charge left a note, um, for the engineer on the next shift. Um, and that note disappeared. So the, the other guy didn't know that the system was offline, turned it on, um, caused a major explosion. Um, the automatic firefighting features had been turned off because there'd been divers in the water earlier in the day. Um, and it had a single point of failure. All of the safety systems were in this control room and they blew up the control room. Um, so there was no way uh, to basically recover once that, that issue started. Um, and so it just shows like, it, you know, it, the, leaving a note is not good enough. You have to have really robust communication uh, procedures. If you think about this, you know, inside your own um, uh, software engineering career, like I'm sure there have been many issues where like one project is handed off to somebody else and it just doesn't quite make it. Um, and it shows where like code review documentation, that kind of stuff is actually really important. Um, and while, you know, we're less likely to blow up the oil, oil rig if we mess this up, it just shows like what a critical piece of, you know, engineering systems it is. Um, next, there's just general secrecy. Um, you know, a lot of us work for private industry. Um, you know, guarding IP is really important. Um, you know, I run a company. I think it's very important. But there's like secrecy, uh, you know, protecting the company. There's secrecy in a way that gets people killed. Um, and, you know, an, ex uh, an example is the Boeing, Boeing 737 MAX. They made, you know, major um, modifications um, from previous 737s. And they said, okay, the way we're gonna compensate is this, is we're gonna change the software inside the, the, the plane rather than retraining pilots, which is expensive. It would mean that you know, fewer airlines would buy uh, the plane because if you need pilot retraining, it's expensive in simulator time and, you know, and just training time. Uh, and, and so they didn't do it. Um, and in fact, um, they, you know, you know, they put a sensor on the on, on the plane. It was basically just supposed to help uh, stabilize the the, the, the plane. Uh, single point of failure to when the the sensor was malfunctioning. Basically, the the plane would take over and you know uh, change the angle of attack. Um, and so it could be flying level, and the sensor would be like, "Nah, you're not level." And so it would do this basically to try and you know bring the plane back level. And in the two cases where there are crashes, um, Ethiopian Airlines and Lion Air, the, the pilots were fighting the plane. And you know, there was another incident where they figured it out, but it was like things that were not in the manual, things that you know they kept as a secret feature, so that you know, even though it affected life or death of the plane and it had a single point of failure, it was something that was not openly, you know, they didn't train people for it, they didn't put it in the manual, they didn't let people know about it. So, uh, you know, pilots were not prepared, and it caused two plane crashes. Um, you know, another example I, I already talked about this is like Bhopal where, uh, you know, not only do they have their faulty siren, they, you know, they didn't tell the local hospitals like what kind of chemical, um, you know, because they didn't have disaster procedures. They didn't tell them what kind of chemical had been released. They didn't know how to treat patients. It was basically like lots of people who suddenly got sick. They didn't know if they were being poisoned. They didn't know if it was a disease that was happening. All of a sudden they couldn't tell what it was. Um, and they, you know, they didn't have an antidote on hand basically to treat people immediately. Thousands of people died because of this. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it, this one's like, okay, how does this apply to us? Well, you know, we all live in, you know, it, in an environment where cybersecurity is always a risk for everybody, no matter how big or small you are. Um, and, you know, one of the things my company has is basically a, a plan of action if we're ever compromised so that we can talk to our customers and let them know if any of their systems have been compromised. Um, or um, you know, if any sensitive data has been released, you know, we design our system so that makes so that is a you know very difficult to impossible thing to possibly happen. But just in case it does, you know, we know who's in charge of communication. We have an email template ahead of time, um, and we know the procedures for basically verifying the extent of a problem. Um, and so that's something that basically anybody who's uh, you know like you know our our our, our parking app, um, you know, here in Pittsburgh got hacked. Um, and they were very terrible about communication and, and letting know that, you know, people that like, hey, 
uh, your credit card information might have gotten compromised, um, or hey, maybe you should you know change your username and password in, in the in the system. Like there was very poor communication around that, and I think we could all could possibly learn from it. Um, so uh, you know, getting down to the end of it, um, so we've got other factors. We've got the Chiso Corporation um, uh, based in uh, Minamata Bay in um, in Japan. They <laughs> They built this new L, you know, LCD process um, in the 1950s and the 1970s um, uh, that was really cool, really interesting technology. Chiso Corporation, by the way, still functioning. Um, but they also uh, used mercury as a catalyst um, in, in that chemical process. And they dumped methyl mercury, which is the most dangerous kind of mercury, into the Minamata Bay, poisoning um, uh, you know, anything down from, you know, the, the plants, like, you know, from the sea kelp to the tiny fish, which were eaten by big fish, which were eaten by humans, and made a lot of people really, really, really sick. Um, and, you know, the Chiso Corporation um, was very good at, about secrecy around this thing. Um, they would buy entire fish catches, so, so uh, scientists couldn't um, check the mercury in them. Uh, they uh, put in a fake safety system and they're like, look at this thing we did, it's safe now. That didn't function at all. Um, they used Yakuza um, to keep protesting families out of shareholder meetings, even though each family had bought like a single share. Um, and, you know, in the middle of all of this, like, you know, the Japanese government was kind of like, well, we, you know, progress is really important. You know, we, we suffered a lot during World War II. We need to build, you know, these new robust industries, which are the future of Japan. And so they were very lax at enforcing regulations on this. Um, we've also, uh, you know, we can see, and I think this one is very, very relevant to us as software engineering, it is, uh, you know, old technology is not replaced when safer alternatives have found. Um, so this was the I-35 Westbridge collapse in Minnesota. Um, you know, a, a lot of us probably remember this. I remember being, you know, like living in Pittsburgh with all of our bridges of, you know, varying levels of maintenance. Um, it was definitely, you know, gave me personally some food for thought. Um, and, you know, the, the issue with that bridge in particular was this gusset plate. They were doing construction on the bridge, so it was overloaded, it had cement trucks on it. Um, uh, but, you know, for a normal bridge, it should have been within capacity. Um, but this bridge um, was built, I think, during the 60s using this gusset plate design. And, you know, one of the things that you can see in, like, uh, bridge collapses is that there's always an issue with, like, uh, vehicles getting more frequent and heavier over time. So, you know, trucks now weigh twice as much as they used to. They carry more higher loads. Um, you know, we, we're more likely to drive trucks or SUVs, which is way more. Um, so there's a lot more stress on bridges. And this gusset plate is kind of an old technology that was fine when it was originally designed, but now is no longer relevant. Um, and that's what failed um, in the bridge and, and led to its collapse. Um, and uh, there's like an entire school bus of children on that on that bridge and all of those kids lived. So uh, a good job to that bus driver. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a kind of a terrifying thing thinking about like, uh, you know, the state of things. And if you you know look at this and you look back at you know at your software engineering, uh, you know you know we've all got um, you know these old code uh, old code old, old technologies, and they're just not being replaced when self safer alternatives are found. Um, and so, you know that's definitely something for us to think about. And just you know to get into like a little bit more depth, um, I, I have ten minutes left, so I'm probably not going to get through all of these. Um, we're going to talk about just a couple of them, um, and my favorite being um, the USS Princeton, um, which you know you can see that guy's hat kind of like you know just boop off off of his head. That's um, uh, Captain uh, Stockton. He designed that cannon along with uh, John Erickson, who designed uh, the monitor um, from the Civil War, um, and uh, this killed two cabinet members pretty much immediately. Um, and the main concern was that the gun was new technology, it was cast iron. Um, it had been fired twice and on this third time it blew up. Um, and it was because like, uh, you know, Captain Stockton, he was the Elon Musk of his day in the US Navy. Like he built this new crazy ship that was the USS Princeton, um, you know, put it with like brand new technology, brand new guns. John Tyler, the president at the time, um, uh, 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 not my favorite president, um, uh, uh, really loved this guy, thought he was the future of the Navy. And, you know, 
he blew up uh, John Tyler's father-in-law, um, you know, by sort of being like, here's this new thing. I'm really excited about this new technology and not putting a lot of thought into how it could fail. And it was ultimately the, the metal ba bands that were just not quite right. Um, they, they'd been changed from Ericsson's design um, and they were the cause of the problem. And, you know, this is related to things we're doing today. So this is uh, the Ponte del Constitucione Bridge. It was built by uh, Calatrava. Um, you can see that it's like, glass on the top, which means anytime it rains, just people fall. Um, and this is like, you know, not blowing up and not killing anybody, but it's also like, you know, oh, look, you can see the canal below. Um, and I've been to Venice. There's not a lot to see in the canal, <laughs> I'm going to tell you. Um, and, uh, you know, but somebody wanted to do something cool and they didn't think about how it would impact end users. And, you know, the result is like lots of people fall down and hurt themselves on this bridge. Same thing, um, a similar thing happened in falling water where, uh, you know, they were looking at building, you know, it, it, concrete and rebar designs were kind of in their infancy. Um, and, you know, there was a, a disagreement over how to build this balcony and it ended up sort of, you can't, the last time I was at, at Falling Water, you couldn't walk on it. Um, and it was, you know, just showing that, you know, even in kind of like the perfection that Falling Water is when you have new technologies, you know, and you don't know exactly how to apply them, you can end up with things that are less than ideal. Um, and if we're going to talk about this in software, uh, you know, this is the Microsoft Bob interface. It's, it's like I remember it from the 90s. I thought it was kind of cool, but it ended up being very slow and difficult to use. And like, you know, if you look at this picture, it, is it really clear what you can do with the things in this picture? Um, so it's kind of a just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, so you know, definitely push the, the envelope of innovation, especially if there are not existing tools for you to use to overcome whatever problem you're trying to solve. Otherwise, like as engineers, we should have enough perspective to be using tried and tech, uh, tested techniques wherever problems are already solved. And hey, that might mean using a, a, a library and reading the documentation rather than building from something from scratch yourself. Um, so here's the, the designing for severe but expected operating conditions. And I wanna talk about one really specific one. Um, so this is Fukushima um, uh, uh, power plant. Um, I've been to Fukushima prefecture. Um, there is still, uh, uh, you know, uh, signs up measuring the amount of radiation in the air in, in that area. Um, and you can see, like I, I highlighted it with this red box here, um, that's the diesel generator room. And what did we learn today about nuclear power? There's always decay heat. You always have to be cooling the reactor. And they put their, you know, their backup generator in the lowest point of their facility, closest to the ocean, so that uh, when the wave hit from you know, the big Japanese 2011 earthquake, it definitely went into that room. And you know, that diesel generator room should have been on the platform or on the hill behind them. Um, and so that was a huge mistake. And what's crazy is that they had a huge storm and this thing had already failed once and they didn't put any urgency behind fixing it. And you know, just to show, like, hey, you know, that you know, height of tsunami wave um, is was not entirely unexpected. Um, this is a rock. Um, it's <laughs> yes, it's a rock. Um, so uh, it's perfectly legible. You'll just have to trust me. Um, it's not written in any kind of special ancient language. It's from 1933, um, and it's up the coast from Fukushima. But it sh it basically like this rock says very literally, "Do not build houses below here because this is where the last tsunami happened." Um, and uh, it's actually up 28.7 meters up, uh, up that hill. Um, so it shows you how high you know, waves can possibly get with tsunami. And you know, the funny thing with Fukushima was it was originally, the, the building site was originally at 30 meters and they lowered it to 10 meters um, rather than building it up because it was cheaper. Um, and you know, if you're thinking about tsunamis, I guess like the best metaphor might be healthcare.gov. Um, which, you know, <laughs> that first day that it was open where people could sign up, you know, on the national exchange for Obamacare, six people were able to sign up for healthcare um, uh, because like it just got hit by a tsunami um, and they were like, oh, this was super unexpected. And like, there's so many things that could have been done to prevent that. For example, a phased rollout where you, you know, you went online for smaller states and you worked your way up to, to larger states um, and not everybody, you know, got access at the same time. You know, we all have different health plans for different states, so it wouldn't even even been a conflict to do that. Um, so, you know, like this definitely has applicability to everything that we do. So like, you know, understanding uh, the extent of, you know, what your requirements have to be is extremely important. And the other thing I'll say that's the opposite of this is that over-engineering is also something to keep in mind. So you, you should, 
engineer for the tsunami wave that you know you can expect and you have historical data for uh you know uh, i i see a lot of things where people are, are you know worried about for example um a uh uh a sunspot storm, you know, causing a major failure of, you know, the electrical power system, which like good prepare for that. But first, for example, and, um, you know, for example, in Texas in 2021, um, you know, before that, maybe prepare for colder temperatures for temperature fluctuations, because we're seeing those more often. In Texas, they had those cold temperatures in 2011, and they didn't prepare. And a decade later, the exact same thing happened. So you should be, you know, you know, pretty historically based on your parameters, you're going to have to make judgment calls on it. Um, but it, it's definitely a part of what we do. Um, so I think it's, you know, very important to think about. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, the, those invisible silent, you know, failures um, and indicators. Um, you know, this is back to, uh, you know, Three Mile Island. Um, and, you know, I talked about the sensors not being visible. One of the other pieces of this is that uh, you might notice in, in this in this picture, there is no control room in this diagram because it's in a completely different building. So when things were going wrong, there was, you know, this was back in, I think the 70s, sorry, uh, Three Mile Island was, uh, I didn't write down the year. Um, I, I believe it's the 1970s, I think 1978, it was during the Carter administration. Um, uh, they were, they didn't have like, you know, CCTV, they didn't have things where they could see what was going on. Um, and so being re removed from the reactor hall was a major source of problems. And honestly, like, don't put your humans near your, <laughs> near your nuclear reactor. That's probably like a good design choice, but it means like uh, you probably need to have, you know, broader sensors and you'd be listening better. Um, and, you know, there's the, the Alamo collapse that we talked about, um, you know, where, you know, you're driving blind and, you know, you don't know, uh, you know, when the road's gonna end and you're not telling other people when the road's gonna end. Um, and, you know, same thing with this 737. So, you know, when that failure, the, when that, when that uh, sensor was wrong, there was no way to know that, you know, it was, it was inaccurate, that that was the cause of the problem. There was no way to know that that feature was the cause of the problem. And so there's these silent failures um, and they can potentially be deadly. And so, you know, for us as software engineers, um, uh, you know, we need to be thinking about um, how do I put, you know, alerts on things, how do I make failures more visible to me um, because I don't want to address them when it's too late. So, you know, that, that has applications in security. So understanding uh, when things have been compromised, because if, if you're going to get hacked for real, they don't want you to, to know, if they won't, don't want you to know that you got hacked. Um, and uh, in a lot of cases, you know, when it's industrial espionage and they're stealing data from you, um, in other cases, they're going to ransom you. Um, so enjoy that. Or you'd want to know if your systems are going down and, you know, before your customers light you up and are like, hey, you messed up. Um, and, you know, the, one of the lessons from Bhopal is that too many alerts is just as bad as no alerts at all. So really calibrating things, they only happen when things serious happen. Um, you know, I know I'm guilty of uh, having things that like uh, trigger at the most sensitive level. Uh, don't do that. But there's, you know, if you're an AWS user, um, for example, there's a ton of internal systems you can turn on that will automatically calibrate this stuff. It will send you an email. It will call you if you set it up, um, if something goes wrong. Um, and you can even rotate it through, you know, your on-call list if that's necessary. Um, and finally, this is like the most important thing, the lack of safety culture. So uh, prior prioritizing um, uh, security and reliability has to come above cost savings has to come above like a, you know, a lax atmosphere. Um, and, you know, this is uh, the Damascus, uh, this is a Titan rocket. Um, there was one in Damascus, Arkansas that completely blew up because somebody had a wrench. It was the wrong wrench. Um, and because there was a lack of safety culture, they didn't say, oh, I have the wrong part. I'm going to go back and get something that's more appropriate. They used what they had because they were like, eh, nobody cares. Um, and they dropped the wrench, it tore into the, the, the uh, fuel uh, tank and like blew this whole thing up and resulted in the death of one person. Um, same thing here in um, uh, the Alexander Keelan platform, again in the North Sea, um, they didn't have a clear chain of command when it came to evacuation because they hadn't prepared for it. No one knew how to use the, uh, the rafts and the sea was too rough to use them anyway. And no one had drilled with them. So like a lot of people died unnecessarily because they didn't have that safety culture where they're checking and preparing for potentially the worst uh, uh, outcome. And, you know, 
in my company, like the thing we have to make up for this, and it's under the like the NIST cybersecurity standards, is a disaster recovery plan. So you think about every way something can fail. Um, you can test these things automatically. Um, there's tons of systems that do this, um, or you can do you know basically you know a, a tabletop one where you're like this this goes down, and you go through all the systems, you know all the way from the technical team finding and diagnosing the problem all the way up to you know, the leadership team potentially communicating with users. Um, and I'd say this is you know, one of the most important things you can do if you have any kind of end user. Um, and you know, if you're gonna do any business with any large corporation, they require you to have this kind of thing in, 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 you know, in, in, as part of your standard operating practice. And we, you know, ours are practiced, they're um, put in place twice a year. Um, and so we know where the left, you know, our metaphorical life rafts are, um, we know how to get into them and we know how to use our, our, our stuff. Um, so this is the end of my talk. I've got a ton of sources. Um, uh, if you guys are interested, um, lots of really great books. Um, there's one really good podcast um, that really helped me to um, internalize a lot of this stuff. Um, it's called, uh, Well, There's Your Problem. Um, and uh, they, they covered maybe half of the cases I studied here. Um, it ended up being like 140 hours of podcast. Don't listen to that much podcast. Um, but it, they'll give you a narrative for this stuff um, and talk about, you know, a lot of the failures and, and uh, you know, how exactly they came together. I think it's a really great podcast to understand this stuff. They're also kind of funny. Um, they do use uh, bad language, so uh, don't listen to it around your kids. Um, but I, if you want to learn more, I would highly recommend this. Um, and thank you guys for attending my talk. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Allison. So yeah, if anyone has any questions, if you want to just um, unmute yourself or you can enter your question into the um, chat function. Um, all right. So it doesn't look, did you answer the one, the, um, do you, did you look at Teflon oh, in your research? So, okay, no, I did not study. So I studied two chemical failures. So I had um, the Chiso Corporation uh, and Bhopal were the two key ones I looked at. Yeah, there's 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 Teflon um, and there's another really good one that I almost added, um, which was basically uh, a microwave popcorn killing people. Like there's apparently like this, this like medical condition called popcorn lung from like the chemicals used to make uh, microwave popcorn. There's only been one case found in people uh, outside of the, you know, the microwave popcorn manufacturing industry. And it was a guy who would microwave popcorn every day and then like open it immediately and inhale because he loved the smell. Um, so, uh, and, you know, they had to put like major, major safety um, uh, systems in place to prevent, um, you know, any further, like this, like people died from popcorn lung. They're kind of seeing something a little similar with vaping, um, which is interesting, um, but I, I have not done research into that thing. Michael Higgins wants to know, uh, what's your favorite book on this sort of stuff? Oh, great. So I have a couple of the recommendations listed in the sources. Um, so uh, Voices from Chernobyl is an amazing book. Um, it's uh, it, it's based on interviews directly with people who are involved with um, the accident itself. Um, it is what the HBO series was largely based off of. It's a really wonderful, very thorough book. Um, I'd say... Uh, Let's see if I can get to the other previous ones. I've also got a book here called Collapse When Buildings Fall Down. Um, it's like not a super heavy book. Um, uh, you know, it seems to be, uh, uh, you know, pretty accessible. I, I'd recommend that if you want to uh, go into things. I also think there's a really wonderful book called um, uh, Why Buildings Fall Down uh, uh, When Structures Fail. So there's When Buildings Fall Down and how and when and why buildings fall down. They're both great books. Um, and if you really want to be scared about our nuclear arsenal, I recommend uh, Command and Control. It's also a great book. Omar Kwan wants to know, with today's software engineering, seems more about integration components from third party um, with the recent um, ransomware attack or incidences. Do you have any suggestions on how to improve the software supply chain? Yeah, and actually this ends up being like almost like a classic supply chain issue where, um, you know, like the... The people who supply supply your software are oftentimes, you know, they're like the people who supply shoes to Nike, um, and it is like part of your responsibility to understand who's supplying things um, and understand sort of the risk associated with them. So, um, uh, it, it, 
so one of the things we, we like doing is um, we build everything in house if we can. Um, for the third party packages we work with, um, we work with sort of um, third parties. Uh, there's a few countries that we don't do not use as suppliers for software at any point in time. Um, if you are filling out, you know, any um, uh, uh, cybersecurity checks for any major corporate partners, they'll give you a list of companies that you cannot work with. Um, you know, one of them being Kaspersky Labs. Um, you know, we had an issue where um, it was possible that. Um, uh, the maker of PyCharm uh, was compromised, but it was like one piece of software and not the other piece. But we were like, yeah, we're not using PyCharm anymore. Um, and, you know, part of it's that we just like kind of keep up with the trades on this stuff. So um, uh, we keep track of, um, you know, when compromises are found within software that we use um, and, you know, intentional or unintentional, there's been some vendors that we've switched around because of that. Um, I'd say it's like, it's not easy and it's complicated and it's like one of my least favorite things. And it's also something we can always be doing better. Um, so if anyone's like, I do these things, uh, I'd be really happy to hear it because a lot of this ends up being more ad hoc than I'd like. Um, and, you know, as part of our, our, our checks, we also have to keep lists of everything that we, you know, use in the system. We love open source, um, you know, for that reason, because it's just kind of like by making it open, you know, you have kind of have everybody watching things, although anybody can add things. The other thing we do is basically like we don't trust anything. Um, uh, so outside of a certain wall, we tend to have things air gapped. We tend to keep things uh, more distant from each other. We don't um, store any kind of sensitive personal identifiable information. We don't store medical records because we don't need them for analysis. So we do not accept them. Um, and we also encrypt, you know, in rest and in motion, um, just because, uh, you never know. Um, and so we always, uh, keep that as, as one of our, our safety tenants. And then in addition to that, we had a whole panel discussion on this at our Cyborg event back in May. So that's available on our, on our YouTube channel. Right. So if you, there should be a channel, um, you can see it says Cyborg. You can just take a look into there. But um, yeah, that's a, that's a, a really hot issue. <laughs> and then one final question from Paul Hanbury. Um, one of the major differences between engineering and software engineering is the cost to build or more specifically the cost to replace being a lot cheaper in software. So how does this affect your comparison of the two disciplines? Yeah, so, really? we are so much cheaper. It's so much easier. We have no excuses. Like that's that's basically it. And uh, you know, uh, uh, if because we're not Three Mile Island, like we like that that instrument panel they built in the '70s, like that was the same one that was there when they shut down in 2019. And we have the privilege of building things out of like thoughts and pixels. Um, so it's a lot cheaper. It's a lot easier for us to do things. I will say that like the, the other difference between like software engineering and uh, traditional engineering is I think we probably build the most complicated things humans have ever built, um, you know, purely out of, you know, logic, math and thinking. Um, and, you know, compared to, you know, a bridge or even a nuclear reactor, some of the things we build are much less straightforward, much less clear. We have a lot less oversight. We have a lot of things coming from a lot of different places and it makes it more difficult. So. It's not only easier, but it's also uh, so much more of a complicated discipline in that respect. Um, so I'd say, you know, I, I'm treating this like a giant analogy um, because uh, this is, you know, they are not the same. Um, and for thank goodness, I don't want to go to jail. Um, but uh, uh, but uh, you know, there's a lot of crossovers, and you know, even if you know you spend billions of dollars building something and people are still building it wrong we should definitely study that and learn from it because if you know we're we're you know spending a lot less money to build something that's more complex you know it means that the 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 failure factors are sometimes compounded in our in our case thank you again allison um so that concludes today's program so thank you so much for joining us today and um, we'll be back tomorrow at nine o'clock here's a link if you want to check out the um, schedule for tomorrow and select your sessions um, but it's been a, a pleasure being with all of you today and i look forward to another fantastic day tomorrow so thank you allison and thanks to everyone for being here all right oh Have and i'll say oh our, yes. our slides are on twitter um and they're uploaded to the sketch platform so uh thank you yeah, thank you. All right. Have a great day. All right. Bye.